Okay. Just a quick response, and then I will get to the cards. But I have okay. preferred for the two of you to be able to go more deeply and express yourselves as the goal of this evening. Danny? I want to come back to the um, Shin Bet heads and the Mossad heads who talked about the possibility that Israel's crossed the, the line. And we've crossed the line of point of no return. The Rubicon has been crossed. That's possible. That's very possible. Let's all of us, wherever we are in the political spectrum, recognize it is very possible that it's too late. It's also possible that it's not. Now, the question becomes... What do we do, well, before we go on there, what's it going to take to destroy the Jewish state? You don't need, you don't need a tank. You don't need a plane. You don't need the Iranian bomb. You don't need a bullet. You need a pen. That's all you need. You need to have European countries do what the Obama administration and the FAA did for about 30 hours in the summer of 2014, just sign a little thing that says, our airplanes will not fly to your country. But then increase it and say, and your airplanes cannot fly to our country. And then if you're an Israeli, the only way to get in or out is by boat. And you don't want to live there. Because it is as lonely a feeling as you can possibly imagine. European airlines followed suit from American airlines that day, and I had friends who were stuck in Turkey, who were called by the foreign ministry and told, go to a hotel, get a room, push the dresser against the door, I don't care how hungry you are, do not go out, we will call you when planes are flying again, and then you'll go right to the airport and get out of there. All you need is for European countries to say, you know what, the country really is an apartheid state. And we're going to destroy it the way we destroyed South Africa. There's still a South Africa. And their borders are the same. The flag is different. The anthem is different. And the values are different. It's not the same country. I think that our fundamental role is to make sure that Washington, Paris, Berlin, and other cities don't use this to destroy the Jewish state. And I think we should be honest and recognize that that is going to be an uphill battle. Not only because of what Israel's done, but because the world has never liked the idea of a Jewish state. Between November 29th, 1947, when the UN voted, and May 14th, 1948, the war had already started, the American State Department urged Truman to bring the vote back to the UN for another vote knowing there was no way it was going to pass a second time. And then it urged Truman not to recognize the Jewish state. And they said explicitly, the Jews, that's what they called them, the Jews will be able to hold out for a maximum of 18 months to two years, and if you recognize Israel, we're going to send in troops. So the Jews did better than that, and America never sent in troops. But you want a whole history of the world's opposition to the Jewish state? We all here know some of it, some of us more, some of us less, it's rich with fact. I think our fundamental responsibility is to do whatever we can with our lives to make sure that the world doesn't get there. And the way to get the world not to get there is in large measure to build in America an overwhelming body of support, not blind support, not an open check, not support for things that are unsupportable, but fundamental support for the entity called the State of Israel because it is about the rebirth of the Jewish people. Simone Zimmerman just said last week in a huge conference call that her whole Jewish involvement, everything that she does Jewishly, is about ending the occupation. It's twisted because that can only make you hate the Jewish state. I also want to end the occupation. But I also want every single person in this room to read five Israeli novels, and they are in English. So everybody here can do it. And I want everybody here to understand what's going on inside Israeli culture. Why is it that on Shavuot, when Benny Lau, who's a leading Orthodox rabbi, teaches at Beit Avichai, and it's a yantif, it's a yantif. Half the place is filled with guys in dark pants and white shirts or women wearing the equivalent thereof, listening to him teach Torah. And half of the place is filled with people on their iPhones taking notes. And he doesn't care. 
Because there's Jews gathering together on the first night of Shavuot to study Torah. You go to Jerusalem in the heart of orthodoxy, that mean, horrible orthodoxy of Israel, and you watch people sitting in jeans and t-shirts on Shavuot night being taught by an orthodox rabbi taking notes on an iPhone, and you say, something magical is happening in this country. Why isn't part of Simone Zimmerman's life also about getting that word out? Why isn't part of Simone Zimmerman's life about all the things that Israel does, let's not enumerate them all now and turn this into a UJA poster contest, about the things that actually make us unbelievably proud. If there's, God forbid, somebody killed at a checkpoint tomorrow in Israel, those kids are going to be all over it. Maybe rightly so. But how many people, innocent civilians, were killed today in Iraq and Afghanistan despite all of America's military personnel doing their best not to have that happen? Probably a lot. How many, Ameri how many civilians have been killed in the war in Iraq? I have no idea. You have no idea. They have no idea. But they don't care. They just don't care. They care about Palestinians more than they care about Native Americans. I don't know why. They care about Palestinians more than they care about Iraqi and Afghani civilians. I don't know why. Something deeply problematic has emerged in the Jewish world where we actually have turned criticism and hatred of Israel's policy in the West Bank into the end all and be all of our Jewish self-expression. That has got to change. And changing that is the place where I think you and I can both make our greatest contribution to the future of the Jewish people.